In 2016, Ubisoft released their take on the loot shooter. The Division was a solid, well-made experience with a comfortable and easygoing journey to level 30, and then the ever-popular problem of no endgame became apparent and many players moved on. I was one of the many who had a good time with The Division for about 30 hours and then never came back to it. With The Division 2, Ubisoft had been promising they would solve the problems of the first game and release a content-rich, complete loot shooter on day one, and I'm pleased to say that they've more or less done that. Before we get to the more interesting endgame discussion, first is the journey to level 30. Your time playing through the campaign will be mostly very similar to the first game, if you've played it. You build up your base, take on missions, do side quests, open world activities, and earn loot the whole way through. It's an easygoing and enjoyable, if somewhat all too familiar, experience. Like the first game, you are expanding a base of operations, your headquarters, through playing the game, adding new vendors and NPCs which unlock things like bounties and crafting. The White House is your base this time around, and I think it's an inferior home base than the one we had in the first game. The White House is rather devoid of personality, there aren't any areas where people just hang out and watch TV, and the layout is far more confusing than it needs to be, with some areas like the clan vendor being way too far away from the rest of the NPCs. The Division 2 also adds a new settlement system. These are basically smaller scale bases of operations out in the open world. Initially, settlements seem like one of the Division 2's biggest new additions, with the promise of getting invested in seeing these areas build up and expanded over time. You expand them by donating found materials and gear and are rewarded with blueprints for crafting mods and eventually weapons. The weapon mod system has been very smartly streamlined. Once you craft a mod, you have unlimited access to them. They are no longer one-time use items that need to be kept track of, which is a great quality of life change. I thought going in that these settlements would be something I cared about more. An evolving place of respite and growth sounds welcome in the drab world of The Division 2, but in practice I never got connected to their growth. It quickly just becomes a system of basic menus, feeding materials into a progress bar, and getting a reward in return. I like that they integrated the mod blueprints into building up the settlements, but I never got emotionally invested in them, which I think is a missed opportunity. Settlement projects quickly just become one of the many things to check off the list while playing through The Division 2. The main bulk of content in the campaign comes from main missions and side missions. The main missions are more or less identical to how they were in the first game. They are linear missions through unique interior settings with various objectives and boss fights, lasting a good 15 to 30 minutes each. One thing I think they do better than the missions of the first game is their environments and set pieces. They never have any effect on the gameplay, but visually the main missions take you through a really wide variety of interiors with lots of personality, including numerous museums, a TV station, and even a jet propulsion lab. Two also adds in a new type of mission content in the form of strongholds. There are three of them currently in the game and are only accessible much later in the campaign, starting at around level 25. They are basically just bigger, longer missions, lasting upwards of 45 minutes to an hour, and they're a welcome addition. There are also some well-set-up and framed smaller set pieces that occur too, like the lights all cutting out and a big explosion happening and a boss breaching through a hole in the wall. The whole game has a good sense of what I would maybe describe as militaristic cool, thanks to the visuals and effective soundtrack, and these little set-piece moments are where the game is at its most stylish. Side missions are more improved and more fleshed out, there are a substantial number of them to tackle, and they consistently feel like mini-main missions, all taking place in unique looking and feeling areas with great variety and objectives, and all lasting 5-10 to 10 or so minutes. There are even a few bizarre secret side missions that only trigger when you are close to them or by talking to a specific character, missions into a secret bunker hidden behind a wall or fighting a mysterious rogue division agent who seems unkillable. The fairly bland, real-world modern setting of the game makes these little weirder flourishes stand out and more along those lines would be nice to see in the future. Then there's the classic Ubisoft open-world activities. In the first game, these side activities were very basic, with only a few different types existing, and quickly became stale. In The Division 2, side activities are everywhere, of course, but thankfully are much more varied and engaging. There are enemy outposts that can be taken over by calling in AI allies, each outpost having its own layout and personality. There are executions to stop and propaganda broadcasts to silence. 
You can also run around and collect shade points, which allow you to buy perks back at the base of operations. The perks, by the way, are all uninteresting, and you can max them out pretty quickly, with only a few being locked behind level 30. But finding the shade points out in the world can often feel like their own little environmental exploration puzzle. No matter what you want to do while working your way up to level 30 in the Division 2, it'll be comfortable and enjoyable. Ubisoft have practically become the kings of making big, easygoing games with tons of quick and rewarding tasks to complete, and The Division 2 is no exception. You'll hit level 30 well before you run out of basic campaign content to get through, which is excellent, and you'll get an enormous amount of loot in the process. The loot in a loot game is always very important, and I'll talk a bit more about loot when the end game portion comes up, but during the leveling process to 30, loot is mostly meaningless. It's a problem every major AAA loot shooter seems to have, be it Destiny, The Division, or Anthem. You get so much loot while playing through the campaign, constantly equipping a better piece of gear, that it makes it very hard to get attached to any of it. Sure, there are some gun types that I really did or did not like, and I'd maybe stick with the one I liked until it was hugely underleveled, but aside from that, I never cared about any of the loot I was getting. It's a very linear ramp up from basic common gear to high-end legendary gear. All the perks and talents of the gear only start to matter as the difficulty ramps up, something that won't happen until you hit level 30, as there's no way to increase difficulty of missions your first time through. Playing through the campaign with others is far more enjoyable, but even playing solo, the game is never very difficult. So not being able to up difficulty is a letdown and reinforces how much the loot doesn't really matter. But you get a lot of loot. Like, a lot of loot. And you're constantly making the numbers go up, and that is still satisfying to my brain, as sad as that may sound. The game is undeniably more challenging than the first game though, even if it never gets hard. This increase from the first game is entirely due to the improvements made to enemies. Enemy factions are far more distinct than the first game. The only different enemy types I can recall from The Division 1 were the guys that had flamethrowers? Every other enemy type in that game is just an identical blur in my memory. In The Division 2, however, enemy variety is fantastic. Different factions all have different abilities and playstyles. There are enemies that love huffing drugs and then charging at you with buffed HP. There are enemies that love RC cars and they'll strap bombs or saw blades to them and then drive said RC cars towards you. There are even military robot enemies. And while I think the faction and enemy readability is rather poor, so many of the enemies from different factions all look alike, their playstyles are varied and exciting. Enemies also seem far, far more focused on flanking you but sometimes enemies seem so focused on pulling off a flank that it just looks comical and broken. You'll see many times where an enemy runs directly at you or your team and just keeps running right past you until he is in cover behind you, all while you are shooting at him. It's a bit rough and ridiculous looking. But overall, enemies are far more engaging and varied to fight and a huge improvement over the first game. They even save an entire enemy faction just for the end game. Much like the enemies, skills have also been substantially fleshed out. In The Division 1, there were a decent number of skills, but in my experience, only three or four of them were ever used by anyone. I stuck with the healing ability and sticky bomb for essentially my entire time with the first game. In The Division 2, there are now eight skill types and four variants of every type. You get things like a riot shield, a turret, a weird healing ball, a chemical launcher, etc. And then within each, you can radically change the function by unlocking and using one of the four variants. The chemical launcher can shoot healing gas for you and your friends, or it can shoot corrosive gas to weaken enemy armor, or flammable gas to ignite with gunfire, or even riot foam that stops enemies from moving. While I do still think there are a half dozen or so of these skills that are clearly the best right now, the different options they provide for builds and synergy when with a team are a huge step up from the first game. When everyone is using abilities that work together and play off of each other, the game is at its most fun. This is you. Oh, I guess this game has a story too? The Division 2 story, unlike, say, Anthems, is extremely peripheral and easy to ignore. I think the best way I'd describe the storytelling of The Division 2 is non-invasive. It's a thoroughly mediocre and self-serious story, but I have so little to say about it because it hardly ever makes itself present. I think Ubisoft knows that these games aren't about storytelling, and thus force hardly no story upon the players. There's probably enough for someone out there to get invested, but on a moment-to-moment -moment basis the game might as well be story-free. 
Or at least it feels that way, and I think that's best for these games. The remaining Black Tusk have nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. Kay is cornered in the arena. Take her out. The game does have some small, mostly harmless, but occasionally frustrating issues. The objective indicator can be really unreliable at times, sometimes leading you down bizarre routes to get to where you're going. You can also enter side missions from the wrong direction, which then causes the objective indicator to get even more confused, and enemies sometimes will spawn right on top of you. There is also just a lot of stuff going on in the game, especially with different perks and symbols, and it doesn't do a great job of introducing you to it all or easing you in. This is a problem that seems inherent to the genre for some reason. Destiny and Anthem both seem to suffer from this same issue. It's also got its share of rough edges. All I ever saw was very peripheral and never game ruining, but they're still there. Things like getting stuck on a tiny piece of terrain or terrain seeming to break, or NPC animations freaking out, or NPC poses being broken. Nothing major, and nothing ever impeding progress or enjoyment, and the developers have been very good about communicating when fixes are on the way, but it's never nice to see all sorts of bugs in a big modern AAA video game. One last negative point before getting into the end game, I think the setting and visuals of 2 are a major step down from 1. The first division, set in a snowy New York City adorned with Christmas decorations, had a tremendous sense of place and mood. The boxed-in, almost claustrophobic feel from the towering skyscrapers, the light cutting between city blocks, the snow swirling, the Christmas lights at night, it was all wonderful and made even more wonderful on PC with some truly incredible visuals and state-of-the-art graphics. The Division 2 moves things from winter in New York City to summer in Washington, D.C. DC is an inherently less exciting city because it's very flat and spread out and lacks any major skyscrapers. Sure, you get the handful of iconic government buildings, but that's about it. The change to summer results in a lot of familiar looking environments with light Last of Us overgrowth and swampy, sweaty looking scenes. It's by no means an ugly game on PC, but both graphically and personality wise, The Division 2 is a big step down. The first game honestly looks like the graphical and environmental sequel to 2, despite it being the other way around. And as a Canadian, the loss of fun winter clothing makes the fashion aspects of 2 way less appealing. I enjoy the simple act of wandering and looking at the division, and have mostly lost that with 2. Alright, so you've now hit level 30. This is the place where the first game fell apart. Throughout all of the marketing for The Division 2, Ubisoft has been saying that they are shipping the game with an end game there on day one. And they did! First, at level 30, you unlock specializations. These are three very powerful weapons, each with their own skill tree, that serve as a sort of ultimate ability to use during combat. You can choose from a grenade launcher, crossbow, or high caliber sniper rifle. Each of them has their own skill tree to invest into, a skill tree that can be respect completely at any time from the vendor, and you can switch between any of the three weapons at the base of operations. You are not forced to tie yourself down to one specific gun or skill tree build, and that's fantastic. They are a nice, though minor, addition to mix up gameplay. You won't be shooting them very often, thanks to infrequent ammo drops for them, but they are excellent in sticky situations and for dealing with bosses. Their skill trees also reinforce the emphasis on creating specific builds in the end game. At level 30, gear also switches to having a gear score, and pushing that gear score as high as possible to 450 and beyond is the new goal. The higher tier loot in the end game all drops with an extensive number of perks and talents and traits. These traits can have noticeable impact on the strength of weapons and can really encourage you to build your character into a very specific direction. This area is something I've only just begun to delve into now that I've hit 450 gear score, and I think this is where the really hardcore endgame players will spend the most amount of time. You can absolutely create very specific builds for your character through grinding for the perfect gear, and that's fantastic. The biggest change that happens once you break past level 30 is the Black Tusk invasion and introduction of world tiers. The Black Tusk are the endgame faction. They are a group of super high-end military with all sorts of fancy technology, and often they feel like they're using a lot of similar tech to what you, the player, are using. The Black Tusk invade after hitting level 30, and Ubisoft uses this faction to very intelligently repurpose most of the content from the campaign. Black Tusk take over all of the main missions and strongholds, turning them into essentially all-new missions. 
Invaded missions, as they are called in-game, take you through the same main mission areas, but now you are fighting an all-new enemy faction that plays quite differently, objectives are completely changed, set pieces are altered, and all-new story occurs. The invaded missions are significantly more challenging and often feel different enough that they might as well be all-new missions. Your goal in the endgame is to push out the Black Tusk invasion. Every few missions you'll cross a milestone and the game will raise the world tier, which essentially just makes the whole experience more challenging and provides even better loot. There are currently four world tiers in the game with a fifth coming soon. You also cannot roll back world tiers once you've progressed forward. The first three tiers are essentially all the same, but with the fourth world tier, most of the open world activities are remixed too. Tier four adds in hierarchical underbosses and bosses to take out and allows you to reinforce enemy outposts basically turning them into super challenging versions of themselves. With the first three world tiers, I wasn't terribly impressed or engaged with the tiering system. The invaded missions and strongholds are tremendous, but aside from a few small changes, the open world felt mostly the same. Tier 4 surprised me though with just how much more engaging I found the changes to be to the open world. Throughout the campaign and the first three world tiers, the open world activities can feel a bit disconnected from each other, but in tier 4, by tying the activities to one another, I found the open world to be far more exciting. One issue that will become quite apparent the further into the end game you get is the bullet sponge nature of enemies. Smart changes were made to the bullet sponges of the Division 2, with armor plating that can be broken to expose the weak human underneath, but world tier 4 and replaying missions on harder difficulties essentially just means that every other enemy you encounter has an enormous amount of health, regardless of them wearing armor or not. It's sort of an inherent flaw of the setting, but having human enemies that can take a thousand bullets is just dumb. There's a fourth stronghold called Tidal Basin and a fifth world tier that will be made available soon in the coming weeks. There will also be the first ever raid added soon, an eight player activity, the details of which are unknown. I dislike not knowing what Tidal Basin and World Tier 5 or the raid are like when talking about the endgame, but maybe once they're out I'll do a mini review update covering them. Their quality will be an important factor in one's investment in the endgame because if the pinnacle goal isn't exciting, then what's the point? Personally, the setting and not knowing what the raid is like are the biggest negatives I have with the endgame experience. With something like Destiny, I am deeply hooked on the aesthetic of the weapons and armor and want to chase that stuff down and I know that once I grind enough for a raid, that raid is going to be a fantastic experience. The dull modern setting of The Division 2 just makes it very hard for me to feel compelled to chase down the best gear, and not knowing if the raid will provide a wild and unique experience like Destiny's raids is a question I am really curious to have answered. While the endgame for The Division 2 may not have much in the way of truly unique content like a raid, the ways that Ubisoft has intelligently remixed and repurposed basically all of the content from the base campaign is really commendable. It's something I'd like to see more games of this type do. I always have a lot of respect for smart and efficient content creation, and The Division 2's endgame is exactly that. More games in this genre, I'm looking at you Destiny, should find smart ways to repurpose content instead of just throwing it away after you've seen it once. It's maybe the thing I respect most about The Division 2, just how smartly used and reused all parts of it are. There is also the Dark Zone, or rather three Dark Zones, and a more traditional competitive multiplayer mode. The Dark Zone has never appealed to me, and while I love the ideas of it, I have never played enough of it to feel qualified to give a verdict on it. They do provide a good single player tutorial for the Dark Zone though, which is very welcome. The competitive multiplayer conflict is solid and enjoyable enough since the core gameplay of the game is great, but I'll always be a PvE player with these types of games and The Division 2 is no exception. Ignoring the Dark Zone and conflict modes, you'll spend about 20 to 25 hours playing through the campaign, and as of right now, you can easily spend another 20 to 25 hours playing through the endgame content and working your way up to 450 and beyond. With the promise of more content coming soon for the endgame, there is very little to complain about here. Over the last several years, Ubisoft have proven themselves to be one of the best in the industry at shipping well-made, content-rich games and then supporting those games tremendously for years to come. The Division 2 is no different. While the dull, real-world setting makes it so that I'll never get truly excited by the content or gear, The Division 2 is full of things to do and loot to get. 
By being a very iterative sequel, it's inherently less exciting, but Ubisoft has clearly learned their lessons from the failings of the first game and shipped maybe the most complete and endgame rich day one experience you can have with a big budget AAA loot shooter. It's big and comfy and easygoing in all the right ways. With an already announced full year of free DLC and more endgame content just around the corner, The Division 2 is an easy recommendation. In case you didn't know, I'm Jameson. All the positive feedback on these reviews is greatly appreciated. Like all the videos on this channel, the reviews take a lot of time to make between playing, scripting, recording, and editing. We have a Patreon page, because of course we do, and any form of contribution to it is deeply appreciated. YouTube algorithms are straight garbage and hate us, and the less we have to rely on the whims of Google, the happier we'll be. Every dollar towards Patreon goes to supporting more frequent and even better videos from us in the future. So if you enjoyed this, consider popping over to patreon.com slash defend the house. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you.